Hi, I'm Sarah McDonough. I'm the Programs Manager here at the Lexington Historical Society. And tonight we are kicking off our Cronin Lecture Series for the 2022-2023 season with Nancy Rubin Stewart, who is an amazing historian of women's history. She is gonna be speaking tonight about her latest book, Poor Richard's Women, which is about the many women in Ben Franklin's life. And this is just one of several lectures that we are gonna be having over the course of this year. It's great to be here at the Lexington Historical Society. Um, I'm, um, I'm really honored. I mean, this is a place of great American history and Ben Franklin is part of this history. So uh, <laughs> you'll hear more about the book, uh, which was also fun, but it would, be, it would be really wonderful if Ben could come back and see all that has happened in Lexington. Thank you, Sarah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. It's really, really an honor to be here. And uh, thanks for coming out. I see that the rain finally stopped. I'm hoping Ben Franklin blessed us so that, uh, you know, he's magical with his electricity. Uh, so, and he did give us a thunder and lightning storm either, which was pretty good. So, um, yeah, and just talk about Ben Franklin for a second, um, which you'll hear in the slideshow. But Ben Franklin. Uh, he loved women, uh, but he found he was as attracted to them as he was to electricity. Uh, but he found that um, that being close to them was really just as shocking and dangerous for him. Oh. So, <laughs> you, you will see that in this in this in this slideshow. Um, I people ask why I started this book or why I wrote it. Well, when I started this book, I didn't know as much uh, about him. I, I I started with a question, which is why I always write books. And I had an answer, which was I did not understand his marriage to Deborah Reed. So I'm going to, there's a lot of slides. I'll try to be as brief as possible, although this will take a while. And uh, please hold your questions to the end if you can, and then we'll uh, be happy to try to answer them. Don't know if I can answer all of them. So thank you very much. So, Ben, you know all about him. Uh, he's obviously the uh, famous scientist and founding father. Uh, he's certainly uh, one of our most famous founding fathers. And um, you, you, I'm sure, know some of these. We've all read them somewhere. Uh, because we always think about him as a person who is filled with discretion about everything. He's always warning us to remember that any pleasure, there's always something you have to remember and not get carried away. And I won't go through these, but you can see them all. He's always warning us. So we do think about him as the father of discretion, no matter, no matter what else we think about him. Um, and these, of course, are the most famous ones. Um, although, actually, there's a couple of others that I think are pretty funny. Uh, for instance, he says, there were three friends in life. An old dog, an old wife, and ready money. And <laughs> he had a pretty good sense of humor. Not all of these are, um, are his, by the way, that are in the almanac. Uh, some of them um, are probably taken, he admits it too, taken from other places, from the Bible, from Shakespeare, from Pope, from Dryden, uh, from some of the other authors. And it's, it's with his skilled pen that somehow he turns them into pithy sayings that we all, well, we all learned about it in school anyway. And some of our parents and grandparents might have reminded us of them. <clears throat> and of course, he's also famous for his thrift. Above all, and of course, who else would be on the $100 bill back then, frankly? Uh, he loved women, as I say, uh, even at 16, when he was an apprentice here in Boston uh, for the New England Courant, his brother's, uh, his brother's newspaper. He was always writing about women. He loved to take the voices of women. I think he liked to hide behind them. He'd take the phony voice, and he'd, he'd lecture, and he'd make fun of Cotton Mather and all the Puritans. And in this particular uh, thing that he used to do, which his brother didn't even know who wrote it, he wrote about how it was wonderful that there were night walkers in Boston prostitutes. And he said they were great for business. They made everybody happy, and they were particularly good for the shoemakers, because they were always wearing out their shoes. <laughs> I'm 16 years of age, he's already into women and looking at them in a whole different way. I think it's part of his genius. <clears throat> well, so he ran away from his brother. Uh, didn't like being whipped, as they did with apprentices who didn't do what they should. And he ended up in Philadelphia, which became his adopted town. He worked for a printer, and he finally roomed with John Reed. This is Deborah's father. He was a carpenter, uh, rather prosperous, and of course, Deborah had a dowry. And he lived there, and he, he said he made some courtship to Deborah Reed. He always admired and respected her. Well, that's what we know about his 
level of affection for her, but they did become betrothed. We don't have any other picture of Deborah but this one. And this, I must say, is taken when she's probably about 50 years of age. Um, and we suspect she probably was always a little plump from some of his other letters. Um, she's reasonably attractive, and here, by this time, they're affluent. So she's dressed very nicely, and she has, um, you know, some, some jewelry here and there scattered about. What do we know about Deborah? Well, it's frustrating. <clears throat> Let me precede anything I say about her by saying that for 243 years, because of what Ben writes about, which isn't much about her, and because of the fact that most books were written about Ben Franklin by men, historians, after all, women didn't have that option uh, for a very long time, that um, Deborah is discounted. She's considered this stupid provincial woman who couldn't read, or well, she could read, but she didn't really write very well. How could she be married to Ben Franklin? This is the male historians continually ask. There's absolutely no context between her and, and Ben. Well, it turns out, thanks to feminist scholarship, that uh, colonial women in Philadelphia did not learn to spell. They knew how to read and write, and even enough to do household finances and, and keep records and to read the Bible. But they, didn't, they were never taught to spell. It was not considered important. So her letters are really pretty terrible. And um, when you look at them, you'll see what I mean. There is a few examples. Uh, and these are some of the better examples. But you, know, you can imagine the people at Yale University uh, and the American Philosophical Society who've undertaken a 50-year project to transcribe Ben's letters and other correspondence uh, and, and get them from the parchment, the, the illegible handwriting, uh, into uh, some kind of print, and eventually digitization. So I just want to point out there's a lot more to Deborah, and I won't go into it too much, than uh, the historians traditionally have done. This woman was a, a fantastic bookkeeper and record keeper and thrifty. Ben even says he was lucky to have, in, in, um, in Deborah, he was lucky to have a woman who, who was thrifty and smart and proved a fortune to him. We know that she kept his books. We know she actually managed many of his financial affairs. Once on a trip, he tells her that he's really glad she's staying home to take care of all of this stuff. And he did a number of things which really surprised me. Um, he was going on a trip. And colonial women, of course, were home and hearth and family. That was it. No politics, no education, nothing. That's it. And believe me, the Colonial women had plenty to do. As you know, a lot of them had seven, eight, ten children if they lived that long. Even doing the laundry was a major undertaking. So, with that said, nevertheless, he appointed Deborah power of attorney. Not once, but twice. So that's extraordinary. And Ben didn't trust people very much, you know, but he did trust her. So we know, and by the way, there are notes in American Philosophical Society ledger books of Franklin where she has her financial notations in there. So we know that this was really true. She was a terrific bookkeeper. She did uh, also work in his, uh, in his uh, post office. He had several post office positions. Um, and uh, she also was an important adjunct to him in, the, in, um, uh, in keeping his books and keeping his records throughout, really up until the time she becomes ill much later in life. But he doesn't write much about her in his autobiography. He just said she was a great helpmate to him. Ben has this way, which kind of drove me crazy when I was researching this book, of kind of glossing over certain important events, emotional events in his life, especially if they were a little awkward. So, you know, he did not marry her legally. I want to come back to that. See if I can get back on this. Back to her, yes. So anyway, he made courtship to her. They were betrothed. And then he had an opportunity, he was still in his uh, maybe 20, to go to England. Um, he was being supposedly sponsored uh, by a governor in Pennsylvania. And he was going to go get equipment, printing equipment, set up his own print shop. Of course, the governor turned out to be, didn't fulfill his promise, but Ben didn't know that. So Ben was going to go off in November of 1724 to uh, England. And just six weeks before that or so, Deborah's father died. All of a sudden, it's a great shock to the family. And that left Deborah's mother, named Sarah, sort of in a bind. Now, Sarah already had been a, sort of a very good, um, 
the Britain flourishing of salve and ointment business, but after his death, she stepped that up. And she did inherit a small amount of money uh, and eventually bought back uh, one, of the, one of the properties that he owned. But at that time, things were pretty rough. Well, Deborah looked at Ben, Deborah and her mother looked at Ben and, and, and her daughter, they were both 18, and she said, you can't get married now. She said, when, when Ben comes back from England, he's set up in a shop, you'll get married then. That was fine, not really for Deborah. Again, we don't have Deborah's records. We have things people said about her. We don't have her records until much later. That's because women, of course, didn't keep, keep writing at that time. And I hate to say it, but Ben threw out the letters when they were later separated or misplaced them for five years. But we know about a lot about her from, from other things. So Deborah is waiting for him to come back from England. He's in England and he has a pretty wild time. We think that's where he referred to this one quote in his autobiography in which he said he began to keep company with low women. Uh, and uh, it's pretty remarkable. Think about it. 18th century, he's confessing this in a memoir. It's amazing. I, I, I was astounded. I mean, you don't see that until, what, 20th century, late 20th century. You don't, you don't see that. Anyway, he's in England. He's having a great time. He's going around to theaters. He's also trying to seduce his best friend's girlfriend, but that's another story. And he writes to Deborah one letter. And he says, well, I don't know when I'm going to come back. And Deborah is flabbergasted and disconsolate, and sobbing and hysterical. And finally, after several months, her friends and her mother say, look, you can't sit around. She's a marriageable age. Encourage other suitors. And she does. And she soon gets married to a, an English gentleman who was here in America. And that marriage lasts about six weeks. <laughs> Why? Well, it turns out he has a wife in England. <laughs> so Deborah goes back with her mother and she will not take her then husband's name. They couldn't get a divorce. Very hard to get a divorce in colonial Philadelphia, in colonial America, in colonial New England at that time, I must say. No proof. Meanwhile, her husband has taken her dowry. He's squandered it. He's fallen into debt. And after about a year or so, there are rumors he disappears. And it turns out he's off to somewhere in the West Indies. And um, then there's a rumor that he's killed in a brawl. Well, that leaves Deborah in an even more strange position. She's neither single nor married. Is somebody going to come after her as the wife and say, collect the debts? She can't get married. She's still the widow. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe that husband's still alive. So she's a mess. And instead of being bright and animated and energetic and very social, all of which she was, she retreats and she really becomes depressed. Ben, meanwhile, comes back to Philadelphia and he sees Deborah's in this terrible state, but he doesn't do anything about it. Actually, what could he do? Instead, he's very busy with his printing business, setting it up. He, he has works for a printer. He sets up a business with a friend. The friend becomes an alcoholic. He eventually buys out the friend um, and he sets up. But meanwhile, um, he's not just doing that. He's dating uh, other women and he dates a number of them. Some of it's recounted a little in his autobiography. And uh, none of the fathers want him. Why? Because printers make poor providers. They don't want anyone marrying. They don't want their daughter to marry some guy and be poor. So we can't get a bride. Okay. He's still a little friendly with uh, Deborah's mother and, and some of her relatives, because of course he'd lived there for a long time. He says he gave them advice. It might have been financial advice. And there's Deborah, totally depressed, antisocial, unhappy. Anyway, he finally sets, gets rid of his partner and he has now this little print shop. B. Franklin Printer is all it says on it. Uh, and uh, in August of uh, 1730, he says to, um, to Deborah's mother, uh, I feel kind of guilty about Deborah. And it's all my fault that she's in the mess she's in. And he says, this is to her credit, the mother's credit says, well, it's my fault too. I kind of pushed her to get married again. 
you know, to get married. So all we know is, again, that always glosses over these big emotional moments. He, all we know is he writes on September 1st, 1730, I took her to wife. That means? Yeah. No. Yeah. Can't get married. She's maybe married. And if he married her, he could be a bigamist. Or if the husband came back, yeah, they might be beaten and tortured. So what does he do? They move in together. Common law marriage. <laughs> That's what it is. Very unconventional, certainly in 18th century. It wasn't totally unheard of, but quite unconventional. So that's Ben. Oh, Deborah's ecstatic. She immediately takes his little stationery shop that wasn't making any money. She turns it into a general store. She imports things from the nearby wharves, Delaware River. She imports things from the country. She has a very thriving business. She's delighted. Six months into the marriage, one day, Ben comes home with a bundle, and he gives it to her. And inside of it is a baby boy. <laughs> Who's the mother? Well, to this day, we don't know. <laughs> there are 101,000 books that have been written, by the way, according to World Catalog of Books about Ben Franklin. And none of the historians or anyone else has ever figured out who the mother is. Was she was one of those low women? I mean, Deb has been married to him six months. This is an infant, OK? Probably a newborn. We still don't know, but an infant, OK? So the historians have abandoned this about going on and on, find all kinds of theories. There's one, one, one scholar, though, who says, J. Leo LeMay, very distinguished scholar, professor, who says, you know, I don't think it was a low woman who was the mother, because had it been a prostitute, Ben didn't have to claim this child as his son. But he does. So it must have been somebody who he knew, whose husband was probably away, and they had a little fling, and then she had the baby, and she had to get rid of that baby before the husband came home. That's what we think. You may know who this baby turns out to be. Any ideas? Uh, William Franklin becomes the Tory governor of uh, New Jersey. Uh, but she never did get along with him too well. She didn't want to take care of the baby. She does admit that she balked at first. She didn't want to take care of this baby. But uh, according to a family memoir, she finally did agree she would raise him uh, out of her great love for men. So, so it goes. They never quite really get along too well. But he does call her mother. Now, Deborah and, and uh, Ben do very well together. Um, as he says, we throve together and we did everything to make each other happy. Well, maybe. But uh, in any case, they worked very hard. Ben, as you know, became absolutely a powerhouse of, of accomplishments. He's elected to the, uh, he's the clerk of the assembly. He becomes the postmaster of Philadelphia. Um, he's busy inventing and, and keeping notes on everything scientific. He's really the most brilliant man. Uh, I think it's Isaacson who said he's probably the best mind in, in 18th century America. And he very well could have been. The man's a genius. And I want to stop and say to you that although this book shows the other side of Ben's personal life, I love Ben Franklin. And I never mean to denigrate him. I am filled with admiration for all that he did. He's, he's incredible. And he's also charming as can be. So I just want you to know that. So what I discovered in writing this book was far beyond my little question about their marriage. Um, and, you know, I didn't expect all of this, but anyway, here it is. So um, they do very well, and he becomes wealthy. Uh, and Deborah is right by his side, working along and keeping the books. And she does finally become pregnant two or three years after they're married with little Frankie, Francis. And, and this, is, this is their child together, and they adore him. In fact, he, he even starts having him tutored when he's about two and a half years of age. He's a very smart little kid and good-looking and fun. And they have a portrait done of him when, at the age of about three. But in the meanwhile, the smallpox epidemic, uh, epidemic which started in Boston, coming from the ports, um, is very bad. And Ben is continually writing in the Pennsylvania Gazette to people get inoculated. 
Now, not inoculated the way we think of it, no hypodermic needles. Rather, they would scratch the pus from somebody who was sick into the arm of someone else, and then these people would be variolated and they would be protected. And Ben is continually writing about this in the Pennsylvania Gazette. He is continually, continually writing, get inoculated. That may sound familiar. Um, things aren't different. Many people did and many people didn't. Some people were superstitious and this was the devil's work and so on and so forth. So, what's going on? It's a little mask. Oh, of course. <laughs> Ben's not going to let me get away with anything. <laughs> the lightning and the thunder, he brought out the mouse. He does a few things about the mouse anyway. But all right. So, come on out. So, no, he went in the bathroom. Went in. <laughs> As I mentioned, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, Frankie gets dysentery. Meanwhile, Ben is promoting get inoculated, get inoculated. Some people are, some aren't, some die, some don't. And Frankie gets dysentery. And so, when the smallpox epidemic comes around again in 17, uh, sorry, 1736. Uh, Frankie is not quite four. He can't inoculate little Frankie. And Frankie is definitely ill with dysentery. And then Frankie gets smallpox and dies. Oh. It's very sad. And you hear about this many years later. It's always something that's on his mind. And Deborah always displays his portrait prominently in the house. It is seven years until uh, she has another child, which is Sarah or Sally. And I'll talk about her briefly. But lots of historians have made much of this. Why is there seven years difference between that first, between Frankie's birth and Sally's birth? Some of the male historians, in fact, recently, even in the Smithsonian, one of them had a big story. If you haven't read the book, you'll see it in there. <laughs> I'm a little upset about it. I make that clear in the book. Uh, and he writes, oh, it's because uh, Deborah wouldn't let him inoculate uh, Frankie, which I doubt very much for many reasons. But anyway, seven years go by. My theory, why didn't she have children? Average woman, and Ben kept track of this in a, in a later essay, average colonial woman, eight births during her marriage. Okay. She didn't only had two. What happened? I think she probably had a series of, of miscarriages, more than likely, and stillborns. So we just don't know. Anyway, she worked very hard by his side. He's so excited about her that um, he writes a wonderful poem which he presents to the Masons, one of the many things he did. I should also say he's been to the Franklin Stove, by Focals, um, he wanted the streets of Philadelphia paved, uh, illumination, a streetlight illumination. I uh, started the fire company, the lending library, the what becomes the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Junto, the American Philosophical Society, the list goes on and on. He's a powerhouse, he's fantastic. He also builds a media, uh, I mean, he's really a media mogul. He really is. He really, he really, he really is the, the Steve Jobs, if you will, of, uh, of the 18th century. And if you think about him that way, he's prominent. <clears throat> he also gets a position uh, in the assembly. Um, he takes the side of the common people. In Pennsylvania, on the western border by the Ohio River, there's a lot of uh, hostility. Some of it's the European wars, including, by the way, what becomes the French and Indian War. The settlers who are out there are being uh, bombarded by some of the American Indian, along with the French, to get that territory back. But the Pens, who own Philadelphia, they own Pennsylvania, they're the proprietors from an old charter in the 17th century. They don't want to pay taxes to defend it, and the Pennsylvania government can't pay everything. So there's a lot of, he organizes citizen militias to get people to, to, uh, to take care of this. And the Pens hate him. They call him the most dangerous man in America. In fact, there's a book by that title. Uh, so he's got political enemies and he's got political admirers. He's very prominent, all of that, okay. So, um, I'll just go on for a second here. <clears throat> Well, we, th we think he really was crazy about Deborah, as I say. Uh, this wonderful poem he does for the Masons about her, I sing my plain country Jane, and all of that. And then the historians found this letter. The story of his, the letters they find is a whole other discussion, but they find this letter, which, by the way, they kept secret for the next 200 years, because it's the founding father. And we have to 
We have to have a perfect image of the founding father, right? As we did of all of our founding fathers, well, until recently. Um, Jefferson and Sally Hemings and, well, a few other things. Anyway, so they kept this letter secret. In fact, when they finally cataloged it in some academic journals, uh, some archives, it was called Old Mistress's Apologue. Well, that sounds pretty, pretty harmless. But when they looked at it again, they've also renamed it this. Advice on to young man on choosing a mistress. And in there, Ben lists eight reasons why you should have. He writes old. Now, let's think about lifespan. Lifespan for the average woman was 42 years. So old was in her 30s, maybe her late 30s. Well, his advice to this young man gives eight reasons why he should have an older mistress, not a young one, this is a young man. I'm not gonna go through the reasons, I'll just give you the skinny on it, okay? Uh, the 21st century version, which is that older women are better as mistresses than younger ones. Why? Because they don't yell, they don't swell, and they're grateful as hell. I can't hear it. You want that again? Yes. <laughs> I think my mic is on, right? Mm -hmm. You know it again? <laughs> they don't yell, they don't swell, and they're grateful as hell. Oh. <laughs> well, we don't know. Again, historians buried it until the mid 20th century, and at that point, somebody brought it up in print. So, you know, there have been many, many rumors about how many children Ben Franklin fathered illegitimately, how many little Benjamin Franklins are around. We don't know. I mean, look at the internet and see 12. I mean, this is ridiculous. But he himself admits he loved women. <clears throat> uh, he became the, uh, the colonial deputy postmaster of the colonies, which was a big deal. He had to reform all the colonies, the post offices, which were very primitive. And he did a lot. He started a dead letter office. He did Overnight Express with relay of, of horses and, and riders, um, and, and he made, uh, he did a lot of other things, which I won't go into, but you can read about them. Uh, and so one of the things he did was he personally toured the post offices, and he did a colonial tour of New England and in Boston, and he's now at the dangerous age of 48. Now by then, he's already known for his electrical discoveries. He's still being published, but he's actually internationally known already. This goes back and forth to England and France and his discoveries. So he's already an international celebrity. He's at now at the dangerous age of 48, and he's in Boston. And he meets this charming 23-year-old woman named Catherine Ray. We don't have Catherine's picture, but we do know she was very smart and quite attractive, and she was absolutely taken with him, and he with her. And when it comes time for her to go back, she's from Block Island, but she has to go back to Rhode Island to get on a, a, some sort of a skiff to get back there. He decides he's going to volunteer on a two-day carriage ride and take her back to Rhode Island to escort her. Yes, there was a driver. Yes, there was another woman who went along part of the way, but we don't know where they stayed. But we do know that they did stay somewhere, and we do know from their letters later that they had quite a romance. And we have letters in which he longs to have her sweet kisses, as a direct quote. And at some point he promises, well, he wants to teach her multiplication. And um, she uh, decides no. So he, he's quite angry about that, actually, somewhere on that trip, in a later letter. And so you have this charming quote from him in which he says, your favorites come with the snowy fleeces, which are as pure as your virgin innocence white as your lovely bosom, and it's cold. So he's rather upset about that. But they do become friends, and they do continue to actually correspond right up to the, right up to the last, life, last year of his life. Uh, he does see her at least one more time. She does eventually, by the way, marry the future governor of Rhode Island, and has a number of children with him. Now, things have been heating up again with the pens. They only get from bad to worse. Uh, Ben is now speaker for a short time on the assembly, and then he, he runs again as enemies have reared up the ugly heads, and then 
and making fun of his son, William and Ben, being licentious. You know, he has this illegitimate son that has become also prominent. So, anyway, anyway, he loses that election, but the assembly has so much admiration for him, they tell him he needs to go to England. And they're going to have him plead with the pens, pay your taxes. We need defense for our western frontier. In fact, some of those settlers were very angry, and there's a lot of racism, by the way, especially with not so much with the African Americans. Slavery, by the way, is still legal. Eve has slaves, as a matter of fact. Um, and, but uh, it's, it's the, uh, a lot of hostility uh, that's going on. And he names certain groups, Scotch Irish, the Germans, that are you know very primitive and come in and actually invade a German town to settle. Anyway. Long story short, they say you've got to go to England and plead with the pens and maybe go to the crown and get them to make this a royal charter, the colony of Pennsylvania, not something that's owned by the pens. So he goes home and um, he says, Deborah, we've got to go to England. And what happens? Deborah refuses to sail with him. Ben is horrified. But, you know, he's very involved in politics, and he says, okay, I'm going to go myself. And he does. And when he gets there, he soon rooms with, take a rents rooms from a charming uh, middle-aged widow named Margaret Stevenson. And uh, you can actually go to that townhouse it's in, near Charing Cross uh, on Craven Street. It's still there today. The guy, in fact, has been there. I haven't been inside. It's now a museum. Uh, so it's known today as the Benjamin Franklin House. We don't know a lot about Margaret. We have a few letters from her and many from her daughter, older daughter. Her daughter is about the same age as Sally now. They're both young adults. And um, he's there for five years, pleading with the pens. But Margaret is much more than his landlady. He at first doesn't even write to Deborah about it. It's just my landlady. And then he eventually talks about her. And pretty soon he's sending Deborah, he's regaling Deborah with presents from overseas. And this goes on for five years. Deborah sends him apples and, and other products, buckwheat and whatever, size of beef or whatever, from here, but trying to get him back. But he's there. He gets nowhere with the pens. He travels all over. Um, we, we, he, she writes to him almost every week. We know because she's always writing in a hurry to make the next packet boat, the mail ships, back to England. But we don't know a lot except that she is running his affairs, his financial affairs, and of course, She's bringing up Sally, and she's going on with all of that, taking care of everything. Um, but he does um, finally come back to Philadelphia. He keeps telling her he's coming back, and he doesn't. And he gets nowhere with the pens, ultimately. Now we're into the 1760s, and things are heating up with the sons of the revolution. Uh, things are getting a little, little rough here between us and the British. And uh, I won't go through why, and you all know why, um, and you know how. Um, so, all he does at that point is he writes, well, I have to tell you that before he comes back, his friend is rather alarmed because it looks like he and Margaret are an item. Everybody knows they're, they're together. Um, she had nursed him when he was sick. She outfitted him in British clothes. She introduced him to British fashions. They socialized together. Everyone assumed that they were an item. His friend, William Strahan in England, writes to Deborah and says, you know, there are a lot of ladies who would sail twice as far to be with Ben. He's very popular here, and he's living with a very nice widow. I think that you need to protect your interests and sail over here. And Deborah writes back, no, I'm not going to come. There are a lot of theories about why she would come over as a very young child on a perilous journey in 1711. And maybe she was afraid. And those journeys were horrible. If you've ever read what happened on those journeys, the ones that didn't get shipwrecked, and people didn't get sick and die, they're really awful. So maybe that's why. Or maybe she felt more comfortable at home. She had a certain status here. It's, it's sort of an outstanding woman who was not only a deputy husband for Ben, but also a woman in her own right with, with many things that she did. In any case, she did not go. So when Ben comes home, He's only here for two years. And he keeps writing to everyone in England saying, I want to go back. Yeah. And Deborah, you can imagine, is heartbroken. And they have a huge argument. And William, their son, 
writes later that this big argument ended up, and Ben said, okay, okay, I'll stay, I'll build this house. And she's thrilled. Well, he gets the house half done, and the assembly says, you've got to go back to England. And once again, he asks Deborah to go, and Deborah says, no. He's there for the next 10 years. Ooh. Yeah. Um, he keeps writing every year, well, maybe I'll take the spring ships and come back. Well, maybe I'll take the fall ships and come back. Deborah, meanwhile, Sally gets married. He doesn't like who she marries. She actually marries a debtor, of all things. This is the guy who wrote The Way to Wealth. An English debtor is there, and but anyway, she and, and he's very angry that she, Deborah gave Deborah Deborah gave her daughter finally permission to marry this guy. That's it. So he's angry for a while. He doesn't write. They have so on and so forth. He also writes to Deborah, which I just broke my heart. I read this. He writes to Deborah. Mrs. Stevenson is the greatest lady in England. <laughs> you know that had a, that had to be pretty tough on her. Um, and, but we do have her letters. This time we have her letters. He did save her letters, or somebody did. And they're, they're newsy, and they're not brilliant. I mean, she's not an intellectual, but she is a very practical person. And they're filled with information about other people and how connected she is to the community. Uh, and she has to finish building that house. Not herself, she has to supervise people. Um, she doesn't know how to do that. Colonial women can do that. Men did that, not women. So she has to take on a lot. During the Stamp Act riots, they decide that Ben was probably on the side of the, of the English government, which he wasn't. And there's a riot. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 almost a, a, um, a civil uprising of people who are going to tear down that house. And there's some wonderful letters from Deborah about that and how frightened she is and how she calls her brother and she gets a gun. And she's defending the house at gunpoint. Finally, Ben's allies come and disperse that crowd. But, you know, this isn't an ordinary woman. This is not a normal, sort of meek, obedient colonial woman. Anyway, Deborah has a stroke after her grandchildren are born. There's a lot of competition with Mrs. Stevenson's daughter's children, Polly, who he keeps writing about his godsons in England. And she keeps writing about the their grandchildren here in America. It's, it's kind of sort of awful, the competition that goes on. Anyway, Deborah has a stroke. The doctors warn Ben. They say her condition and everything, she's not going to live too long. And Ben keeps writing, I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back. Yes, he's been busy placating Parliament, trying to get the Whigs on his side and, um, and, and get rid of this oppression and get things peaceful between the colonies and this is now into the 1770s, early 1770s, and it's well after all the, the Stamp Act and, the tea, and the, all of that, the Tea Party, and so on. So, uh, Deborah dies, uh, and William is so upset, he even writes to his father. And, and Deborah had done that too. She said, I, I'm sick. I'm not sick because I had, and use the word stroke. I'm not sick from that. I'm sick because I'm missing you so much. It's kind of, you know, poignant. But when she dies, then William writes to his father and says, you know, I wish you'd come back. She really wanted to see you. Anyway, that's that. So he does come back right after Lexington conquered, just a few weeks later. Well, he's, he's here in uh, Philadelphia. <clears throat> and he does do a great deal of service, including, of course, signing the Declaration of Independence and many things for Washington with the new army and so on. And then once again, he is, he is uh, you know, asked to do something for the colonies, and this time is to go to France and get some money, get some loans from the new American, struggling American nation. And he does. He does go in uh, 1777 uh, to France, to Paris. And as you know, that's, by the way, Margaret Stevenson's daughter, Polly, who sort of is always in competition with Sally, his own daughter. Oh, yes, sorry, I want to diverse briefly. Uh, rumors about Ben and his meanderings with many women. Uh, young Charles Wilson Peel, who later becomes a distinguished American portraiture, uh, had been studying art in London, and he roomed in Mrs. Stevenson's home while Ben was there. And one day he walked into Ben's room, they obviously knew each other, and lo and behold, there was Ben with a lady who he's engaged in kissing. And this one is even more explicit. Um, 
Charles Wilson Peel is about 21, and he rushes back to his room like any good art student and quickly sketches what he saw. Again, these pictures were repressed for over 200 years. We don't know who this, these people are. We don't know, this is not Pauline, this is not Mrs. Stevenson, but we don't know who that is. Anyway, off he goes to France. He works very hard for the French government, with the French government. He does get us the loans. He does uh, attend many uh, festivities. John Adams certainly didn't, wasn't approving of that. Uh, he's up late at night, he's going to parties, and he's going to balls, and he's, he's hobnobbing with the French women and flirting with them. Ben admits, he's now in the 70s, he likes to flirt with these French women. He finds them very attractive. And so he has a number of romances. And one of them is with this lovely, she's supposed to be the most beautiful woman in France. She's also an accomplished musician. She's a uh, sort of a, a, a patron of the piano, piano forte instead of uh, the harpsichord. And they have a, quite a romance. And there's wonderful letters between them. She's married, she has children. Wonderful letters um, in which she declares her love for him. She sits on his lap in public, kisses him, calls him little shit, ha ha. There's even a book by that name. Uh, but ultimately, she will not grant him the last favor. And so, of course, he moves on to the next one. <laughs> that is Madame Helvetius, who was uh, the widow of a famous philosopher, and she is uh, happily uh, ensconced in her own little chateau and introduces him uh, and has a romance with him, but she's a little scattered. She's very unconventional. She has three single men living with her in her estate. Uh, two are abbeys, and one uh, is a medical student, and they keep track of her. She's flitting around here and there. They have quite a romance. He proposes to her many times. He does propose to her so much, finally, and I guess rather violently, finally, that she flees to the south of France. And like all of the romances that I will mention, that we know about, this converts eventually to a friendship. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. You can read about it in the book. Um, but I have to say that my research on this book changed my view of Ben Franklin. Uh, it made him more human. I mean, this is one of his famous quotes. If passion drives, let reason hold the reins. A master of discretion. But this is a human being. This is somebody who was a human being. Now, my theory is that he really had private struggles with with passion and prudence. And we have this image of him as the ultimate rational person, always, always reason over instinct, always reason over emotion. I don't think so. I think he was a flawed human being like the rest of us. Um, so I want to thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if, if you read the book, please put a review somewhere. If you buy it on Amazon, put a review there. That would be great because we need them. Uh, I'm not a proponent of Amazon, but it's the giant. Um, or good reads and really appreciate the reviews. Um, and you don't have to do that either. But if you have historically minded friends, please take a postcard. Uh, they're over there and send them on to um, anybody you think might be interested. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>
So we had John Adams being furious with him staying up late at night and, and drinking this French wine and flirting with the French women and all of this. This is all part of his technique. Uh, by the way, Marie Antoinette never did like him. Uh, but but the, the rest of everybody else did. So um, this was a very shrewd guy. He, he actually compares America to the Virgin, uh, who's waiting to be um, having somebody court her. So you can't go up and say, would you please marry me? Which is equivalent to, would you please give me money? But she had to be back there and be charming and likable and needy and so on. And then somebody would, a man would come up and then would just start courting her. And that's, he uses that analogy, by the way, uh, which I find, you know, kind of interesting. And that's how we did it. And if you read his letters, they are charming. I mean, he's very, very funny. Uh, he always has the bon mot. One time, Madame Malthusius, his last girlfriend, stood him up more than once, and he writes how he, he dressed, he coughed, he dressed, he made himself, he combed his hair, he, he, he made himself as presentable as possible, and he took the carriage and he went to her home, and she wasn't there, uh, but it was okay, because he knew he would see her again soon. I mean, he's very charming. And he's very funny. He just comes out with these funny expressions. For instance, when Margaret, his English girlfriend or landlady, um, is in a sulk, he says, she's, she's in a pie crust. I mean, the man had a very funny sense of humor. So this is how I think. I know. Yeah. And you don't see a lot of temper uh, in his formal rights. Here and there you do. You see that come out here and there. But he's pretty careful. Uh, he writes a really nasty letter about um, Arthur Lee, a really vitriolic letter, and talks about him being paranoid. This is the word paranoid. And he says, you keep this up, you're going to be, you know, a mental, uh, you're going to be insane, the way you just hate all these people. But then he rips the letter up, and he, he doesn't do it. So he, he learns to control himself, even then. Other questions, please? Yes? There was a story about... Uh, be hit. Uh, it, I, I may have this wrong, but that he was insulted by the King of England. Do you know anything about that, or is that just a story? I don't know. There's a lot of stories about Ben, and as you know, <laughs> some are true and some aren't. I don't know um, whether that was true or not. Uh, but I do know that, uh, well, you may be referring to what happened in the uh, Privy Court at the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, that may be the cockpit. That, that he got mad. And the left. cockpit. Well, because of the Wadley affair, which the letters that were supposed to be private to the Adams that were about Hutchison and how Hutchison pretended, oh, I love Massachusetts and oh, I said the British are treating you well, but he really was, was two faced. And so Ben had some of those letters when Paul was a man named Thomas Wadley, who was deceased by the time they went to Massachusetts Assembly. And uh, unfortunately, Sam Adams published them. They were supposed to be kept quiet. And anyway, that got back to England, along with some other things, of course, the hostilities between us. And so he was hauled into the Privy Court to what was the cockpit, which, by the way, was um, cockpit room, which, which, by the way, was from Charles Henry VIII, where he used to have cock, cock, cock fights, enjoying them in, the privy, in a Privy Council. And so there's a terrible section, I don't go into it too much in the book, where he stands there and he is roundly castigated and insulted. And basically, they strip him of the post office uh, uh, honor he had, which paid money. Um, and after that, he is no longer uh, for England, which he loved. He is now for America. And that's, in fact, there's a book by that called The Americanization of Benjamin Franklin uh, uh, by Gordon Wood. One of Pulitzer on that. Um, so that's probably what you're referring to. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, could you share a little bit about your process of writing the book? <laughs> okay. So I started 28 years ago on this book, and nobody cared. They said, "Well, ah, Deborah Reed Franklin, she's a stupid woman, and way below Franklin. And why we don't need this book on her." So back that went into the files. Back files. Writers never quite throw everything out. So about 12 years ago, I said, you know, I think maybe there's a good book here. So I brought it out again and did more research. In fact, that's when we happened to be in England, and we did go to the Ben Franklin house, not inside, but outside because it's locked. 
And once again, I tried uh, with a couple of publishers. Nobody cares about Benjamin Franklin's wife. All right, so around 2016, I said, you know what? We're doing a lot more on women in history. We're really humanizing history everywhere, which is, of course, what is happening in history, uh, for better or for worse. And um, I said, I've got to write this book. And um, a couple of my books have been published by Beacon Press. There's a couple of them over there. Uh, they said, yeah, we'd like you to do that book, but we want you to also include his French women and other women. I thought, oh, that's kind of a big honor. So anyway, did, I did, I did the proposal, the chapter, sample chapter, the marketing, and so on, and I began. And fortunately, by then, and this wasn't the case 28 years ago, the Ben Franklin, papers of Benjamin Franklin, that are still being transcribed in Yale University from the parchment, still being transcribed, or volume 48. If you've ever seen them, they're big volumes. You have to go to an academic library or the Boston Public Library and see them. It would take a lifetime to get through them. It's almost 30,000 letters. Um, it would take you more than a lifetime to get through them and pick out which ones were from Deborah and which ones. It would take you forever. But fortunately, by 2016, when I started to do the research again, I discovered they'd been digitized in the Library of Congress. <laughs> which made it much easier. It was not exactly a day at the beach, but I was able to, to work on that. And uh, a lot of this work took a long time, um, and then came the pandemic. And uh, well, it was, a, it was a good way to spend the pandemic. Um, I had a lot of fun with the letters. Um, I couldn't go anywhere, I couldn't do anything. And that, that helped me. I worked very hard. I worked eight hours anyway a day. Um, sometimes more, you can ask my husband, uh, more of them, and uh, think about them, dream about them, and so on. But the idea is that to be as honest as you can with what you have and not bring in a bias. Uh, I mean, I'm a journalist by training and by, by jobs, so try to be as, as fair, fair-minded, and show both sides as much as I can. I hope that helps. Thank you. Been a great audience. Um, I hope you enjoyed the book, or at least I hope you enjoyed this talk. And please take a postcard on your way out um, and send it on to someone. Thank you so much.